I'm sure many of you have watched the hit Netflix documentary, The Tinder Swindler. $20,000, $30,000, $140,000. His life depended on me. That's when police tell me. The man I love was never real. The Tinder Swindler is about a con man named Simon Levive. Levive financially destroyed women using the popular dating app by making his dates believe that he was actually a diamond tycoon. He's a pretty slimy guy. Then one day, out of nowhere, I get this message in my inbox. It's a video from Simon Levive, the Tinder swindler himself. Hey, Javier, Livia, how are you, my friend? Here is Simon Levive. I want to congratulate you of catching the real Frank Abignal from Catch Me If You Can. Someone thought it would be funny to ask Levive his thoughts on turning the Tinder swindler into a hit Broadway play similar to the Catch Me If You Can musical. You know, the thought turning the Tinder swindler into a musical, well, that's going to be amazing, my friend. Amazing? Uh, that's crazy if you ask me, but hey, let's give it a shot. Stop, 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 stop. If you're feeling nauseous by all of this, it's because it's disgusting. I would never go see a Broadway musical based on this guy's life or watch J.J. Abrams direct Tinder Swindler the movie. And you wouldn't either. Because we all know that there are women still out there paying the debt this guy left behind. No one should ever turn the Tinder Swindler into a musical. It's ridiculous. So then why on earth would Hollywood and Broadway feel the need to romanticize Frank Abagnale's life? Aren't his crimes equally appalling? But Javier, we didn't know Catch Me If You Can was not real until we heard your podcast and read Alan Logan's book. Well, good point. I'll let it slide. But now that you know what you know, how do you feel? Despite the mounting evidence, even today, respected and trusted organizations are honoring this guy's life. A life based on nothing. Just last month, Frank Abagnale was given a Hero in Ethics Award at Xavier University. Would you feel good about giving Simon Levive, aka the Tinder Swindler, an Ethics Award? Unlike the rest of us, Xavier University can't claim ignorance. I wrote the university and let them know that they had the wrong guy. Frank Abagnale doesn't deserve an ethics award. Was Malala busy that week? I mean, she deserves an ethics award. But despite knowing the truth, they went along with their little ethics ceremony anyway. But get this. We showed up and confronted Frank Abagnale during the ceremony. Welcome to Cincinnati. Thank you. I don't believe you answered his question. You, you dodged it pretty well. So... I wonder, in light of what the ethical award you're going to be presented tonight, would you come clean? Would you tell the truth about the stories you've told and admit that you just lied to everybody and you're still conning them? I don't believe that's the case. I don't give talks about my life. I basically give seminars. Let's just say that this ethics award ceremony didn't go as planned. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. So ask yourself, why would anyone ever make a comedic thriller based on Frank Abagnale's life? And why would anyone ever honor him with a Heroes in Ethics Award? It's bonkers. Frank Abagnale is your parents' Tinder swindler. He basically did the same exact thing back in the 70s. JR, Frank Abagnale's girlfriend back in Houston. Abagnale allegedly opened up credit under her name and left her bankrupt. 
he destroyed her life. And just like the Tinder swindler, Abagnale was accused of carefully choosing his victims. JR, his ex-girlfriend, told me that the first time they met, she explained that she was in a plane waiting for it to take off when out of nowhere, Frank Abagnale appeared and sat down next to her. She initially thought that he was a pilot, but after they started dating, she got the sense that something wasn't right. JR says that he would just disappear and then suddenly return unexpectedly. In hindsight, Abigail only reached out to JR whenever he needed her, like the time he was getting ready for parole. Abigail wrote JR from prison. She thinks it's because he needed a place to stay after his release. JR describes a darker side of Abigail that's in conflict with the calm, cool, nice guy that we've fallen in love with. She says that Abigail could lose control with a flip of the switch. She describes him as having a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality. Just like the Tinder swindler, when Levive lost his shit after one of his victims, uh, Pernilla Showholm confronted him. I'm not so good, Simon. What is it? Can you just tell me the truth? I know about the other people that you have frauded. You double crossing. I can tell you right now, you will pay for that for the rest of your life. And I, can I am paying for the rest of my life. You took no, everything no, I have. No, no, this is your mistake. Frank Abagnale was the original Tinder swindler. I wonder what Pamela Shoham, one of the subjects from the Tinder swindler documentary, thinks of this OG con artist. So I called her up. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Yeah, no worry. Pernilla is just one of the many people targeted by Simon Levive. She lost all of her life savings because of this guy. And financially, how are you doing? Because I'm sure people want to know that too. I'm not struggling. I shouldn't say that, but it's not like I earned the money back yet. You're probably wondering why I'm even talking to you because I'm not covering the Tinder Swindler. Yeah. I have an eight part series on Frank Abagnale. Do you, mm -hmm. are you familiar with Frank Abagnale? The Catch me if you can, right? Exactly. You know, our <laughs> con artist, his favorite movies were Catch Me If You Can, Wall Street. I don't know why Leonardo DiCaprio is involved with all of this, but then he <laughs> added in Blood Diamond as well. I wondered how Pernilla would feel if Broadway turned her life tragedy into a dazzling jazz hand extravaganza. How would the victims react to a hit Broadway play of the Tinder Swindler? I think it would depend on the narrative out of it. I think if you would portray him as like, whoa, like this guy is the deal, I think it would be very, very tragic. And we would go back so many years and what women have been fighting for the entire time. So I take it Pernilla wouldn't be a fan of the Tinder Swindler musical. And I have a feeling we won't be seeing that anytime soon. So why do we continue to celebrate Frank Abagnale's life? Let's go back to Xavier University, where a room full of business students, professors, lawyers, accountants, and even current members of the FBI are eagerly awaiting Frank Abagnale's hero and ethics acceptance speech. I can't even say that with a straight face. I'd like to welcome you all to this year's Heroes of Professional Ethics lecture. Xavier University's mission is built on moral and ethics responsibility. At least that's what they say on their website. And out of all the people in the world, every single person in the world making a difference, they chose to honor a guy who rips off his own girlfriend and is accused of feeling up college girls pretending to be a doctor slash pilot recruiter. Seriously, did they even read this guy's Wikipedia page? So thank you all for coming. Some housekeeping. First, uh, there's two exits right there and there. Um, we don't expect any fire drills tonight, but if there are any, uh, please leave it in orderly fashion. There you hear that, Frank? Just in case you need to make a run for it. I'd like to welcome you all to Mr. Frank Abagnale. Good evening, folks. It's a pleasure to have all of you here this evening. I was here in 2000. Little does Frank Abagnale know that a listener of this show and fellow podcaster Jim Grinstead from the Scams and Cons podcast is sitting in the audience. The plan is to ask Abagnale why he deserves an ethics award. Maybe the ethics award will compel him to come clean and tell everyone his dirty little secret. Jim sat patiently while Abagnale ran through his tired PowerPoint presentation on cybersecurity. After the hour-long presentation was over, Abagnale made a big mistake. 
I'll open up for questions. You may ask me any question you like. There are no restrictions on the questions you want to ask. If these are something I covered, didn't cover, or it's something personal, whatever it is, I'll be happy. They're going to pass a microphone around. And, uh, they can ask him anything, even something personal? It's almost as he's egging Jim Grinstead on. But before Jim got a chance to ask Abagnale a question, a plant from Xavier University intercepted. Could I ask you one question? Yeah. Sorry. Um, there's a book that came out about a year ago talking about some of uh, your personal life, some activity. And uh, actually, I got a call from a, a person this morning asking me, why are you bringing Frank Abagnale to campus with all the stuff that was happening in this book? Can you tell us a little bit about that book and what what's going on with that or what was happening with that? I actually have never read the book, but there are people who have judged me all my life. The thing you need to understand is once you make a mistake, you have to live with that mistake the rest of your life. People will not forgive you, people will not forget, and people will always hold it against you. Uh, people in my own church hold it against me. I did it 50 years ago when I was just your age, and people still hold it against me. There are people who judge me. Uh, the guy who wrote Catch Me If You Can, Stan Redding, was a police reporter. He interviewed me twice and he wrote the book. He exaggerated a lot in the book, so the publisher put a very strong disclaimer in the front page of the book published in 1980 saying that all events, dates, names, places have been changed in this book. Steven Spielberg bought the rights 20 years earlier when he was making Jaws. He then made it 20 years later and he converted it into a movie. I was not involved in the movie, I never saw a script in the movie, no one talked to me from the, the movie before the movie was made, and they made the movie and they made their version of it. Then Broadway made a Broadway musical, won the Tony Award on Broadway, and they made their version of the story. All I can say is this, I've been married to my one and only wife for 46 years, I've taught at the FBI Academy in the field of the Bureau for more than four decades and have taught two generations of FBI agents, I hope that in the end, when it all comes down to it, when I pass away, that people will not worry about what I did or didn't do 50 years ago, but will take a look at what I've done with my life uh, the past uh, 50 years, and that I did live in a great country that gave me the opportunity to serve my time, pay my debt, and to come out, spend five years on parole, and then go and do the things that I've done with my, my life. Uh, that's the only real thing that's important to me. There are people going to write vicious books, there are gonna, people going to write things that are not accurate. Uh, I don't contest them, I don't say anything about them. When the movie came out in 2002 on Christmas, on that day I wrote a statement on my website, one full page. That statement's been there for 20 years. Just go to my home page, <coughs> click on it. And I said that at that time all I was going to say about the movie, my life, what was true, what was not true, etc. And what was important to me back then, 20 years ago, as it is uh, today. And we have a later right here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Boy, there's a lot to unpack there. We'll get to that in a bit. The big takeaway here is that even before opening it up to Q&A, the university had to address the controversy. That means that all of this reporting is actually working. Jim Grinstead is sitting in the audience patiently waiting for his turn. Now that they've cleared the air, a woman gets up and asks a question about credit cards. When you were talking about credit cards for younger people that are 16, 17, 18... After Abagnale answered her question, Jim Grinstead finally got a hold of the microphone. Welcome to Cincinnati. Thank you. I don't believe you answered his question. You, you dodged it pretty well, but <laughs> your fame and your fortune has been pretty much built on stories that you've told that are all lies. And there are public records that document that during the times you outlined, you were actually in jail. So you couldn't have done those things. So I wonder in light of what the ethical award you're going to be presented tonight, would you come clean? Would you tell the truth about the stories you've told and the lies? And you may have performed, but will you come truth and admit that you just lied to everybody and you're still conning them? I don't believe that's the case. I don't give talks about my life. I basically give seminars. Uh, that's what I do, just like I'm doing this evening. And uh, obviously, again, uh, what I did 50 years ago is irrelevant. I didn't make the movie. I didn't make the book. I didn't make the Broadway musical. If people made money off of telling that story, that was their uh, prerogative to do that. Um, I basically have lived my life the way that I felt I needed to live my life. But I'm well aware that uh, there's going to be people who think like you think and people who 
uh, look at me in a negative way, that's just part of life and I've got dealt with it for 46 years and I'll deal with it for the couple more years until I decide to retire from uh, doing this. That's all I'm going to really say about that. Yes, sir. The audience clapped for Abagnale. Can you friggin' believe that? A round of applause for a con man getting an ethics award? I mean, even Steven Spielberg wouldn't put that in a movie because it's too far-fetched. But here we are, a con man exposed by a true hero in ethics, Jim Grinstead, the host of the Scams and Cons podcast. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful odds. Jim pulled back the screen and revealed that the man behind the curtain is a fraud. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. But unlike Dorothy, the audience chose not to accept the truth in front of them. There's no great and powerful wizard. It's just a simple man in an oversized suit blowing smoke up their collective ass. The great and Instead of snapping out of the trance and coming to the realization, the audience ignored the truth and chose to mock Jim Grinstead with a slow clap. Now, let's talk about the slow clap. A slow clap is unlike any other clap. Look, you can't just start a slow clap at any old time. You gotta wait for the right moment. But how am I going to know when it's the right moment? Oh, you'll know. It doesn't carry the weight or the prestige of the thunderous applause, and it's not quite as synchronized as its distant cousin, the wave at a baseball game. Here it comes again. Get ready, get ready. Ah. The slow clap starts with one brave soul who's clapping despite the reality around them. It's the most ironic of the claps. The people at this ethics ceremony just heard twice, once from the Xavier University plant and the second time from Jim Grinstead, that the man in front of them is lying. And despite all that, they united in a front of ignorance. That's all I'm going to really say about that. Yes, sir. The rest of the evening went off without a hitch. No one asked any more questions about Abagnale's past. Everyone just pretended that the truth bomb that Jim Grinstead dropped on them never happened. It made them feel icky and gross. They were much more comfortable playing make-believe. What an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? How would you have reacted if you were sitting in that audience? Honestly. Once Abagnale was done taking questions, a group of current FBI agents took a picture with the con man. It was the cherry on top of this truly unbelievable ethics ceremony. <laughs> but let's not forget what really happened here tonight. For the first time ever, the event organizers were forced to recognize the work that we're doing here. The podcast, Alan Logan's book, your emails, it's working. And together we've made a gigantic structural crack in the Abagnale facade. If these companies knowingly hire this guy to speak at their event despite the mountain of truth that's out there, they have to address the elephant in the room. I called up Jim Grinstead with the Scams and Cons podcast to talk about his experience. I think the most remarkable part of this whole evening was after you asked him that question and he gave his response, what did the audience do? They gave him a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> And I just sat there. I didn't react to it. But in my mind, I'm going, yep, this guy's a con artist. This is what they do. They create this environment where you feel like the right thing to do is to stand up and defend this guy. And as opposed to thinking about, maybe I should go home and look this up. Well, I just think it's so funny, your question. I love the way you position your question, because you said, in, I wonder, in light of, of the ethical award you're going to be presented tonight, would you come clean? And in a way, you're offering him an opportunity, an in to actually own the long con, right? This is his opportunity to have that mastermind moment to say, yes, I've been playing everyone along this whole time, but uh, he didn't take it, did he? You know, you're right. You're being given an ethics award. It would have been, it would have ended all this controversy if he'd have just said, you're right. I'm 72 years old. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've been given an ethics award and 
that includes owning up to what you've done. And so you're right. I've told a lot of lies and did a lot of things and fabricated stuff. Yeah, but instead he said, I didn't make the movie. I didn't write the book. I didn't make the Broadway musical. The same answer that he gave me. But this time it felt different because when I interviewed him in Vegas, it was an ambush. He didn't expect it. And I had a very limited amount of time because he could just leave at any moment, but not this time. Now you are asking him questions in front of an audience and he can't go anywhere. So he has to answer. And I feel like he gave you a much thorough response, a very similar response to what he gave me, but a little bit more fleshed out. Yeah, I think and it's interesting because he invites it on the tape when you uh, listen to it. At the end of his speech, he opens up for questions and he says, ask me anything personal, professional, whatever. Nothing is off the table. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting, too, because I wouldn't accept Q&A at this point in his career with all the scrutiny that's happening. What is it? The old line saying is that I don't care whether you print something good or bad, just spell my name right. Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly it. I think what you said earlier is quite true, is that focus is being put on him and he's not sure how to deal with it yet. So whenever he gets hit with these questions live rather than, you know, being called and asked for comment, it really throws him. He's not on firm ground on that. I think it's really interesting, too, that towards the end of his response to you, he said, I've dealt with this for 46 years and I'll deal with it for a couple more years until I decide to retire. And I'm thinking maybe you should decide to retire sooner rather than later, because his next speech, his next speaking engagement, he's not going to know whether people like you, people like me, and I'm not asking people to go out and approach him, but when people listen to this and read Alan's book and listen to my podcast, they are enraged that this guy is going around making a profit from people who he scammed based on a lie and they want answers. And he's never going to know. He's going to walk into the next speaking engagement with his tail tucked between his legs because he's just not going to know when somebody's going to confront him, right? Yep, absolutely. When we come back, what does an expert on deception have to say about prolific liars like Frank Abagnale? Plus, Frank Abagnale has a sleepover with Leonardo DiCaprio, despite the fact that Abagnale was way over the age of 25. Scandalous. Jim Grinstead and I both faced off with Frank Abagnale hoping that he would finally come clean. But this isn't the first time that Frank Abagnale has been confronted with the truth. Remember the college students who called Abagnale out in the early 80s? Abagnale was so spooked by possibly being embarrassed in public that he called off his highly publicized keynote speech. Those students were sent there by a criminal justice professor named Bill Toney from Stephen F. Austin State University in Texas. The professor, Bill Tony, had listened to Abagnale speak and challenged his students to investigate some of the con man's claims. The students quickly learned that Abagnale's story was based on lies. After this revelation, hiring this guy as a speaker was becoming a liability. Abagnale was already scheduled to speak at several universities. Some canceled, but some took a different approach. The University of South Carolina asked Abagnale to sign a document guaranteeing the truthfulness of his lecture. A simple promise that everything he says on stage is true. Seems pretty reasonable to me. But the con man couldn't bring himself to sign this so-called truth affidavit. In fact, he downright refused. As a result, the event in South Carolina was canceled. Seriously, this guy isn't capable of telling the truth. It's almost like he can't help himself. Even when responding to Jim Grinstead at Xavier University, he added a few more zingers. A lot of people ask me, do people like Abagnale actually believe their own lies? You know, I'm not sure, but I personally think that he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows his character. He's memorized the lines. Fortunate that 31 years ago on an undercover assignment. 40 plus years ago on an undercover assignment in Houston, Texas, I met my wife. uh, I met my wife on an undercover assignment. He's told this story so many times for so many years that he has an answer for everything. He's like a jukebox of lies. But deep down inside, I think he knows he's full of shit. But maybe it's not his fault. Maybe he can't help it. I wanted to learn more about this kind of obsessive lying, so I contacted an expert. 
My name is Dr. David Markowitz. David Markowitz is a communication professor at the University of Oregon who specializes in the study of language and deception. So are most people honest? Are most people that we interact with on a daily basis, are they just honest people or are all of us capable of this type of deception? So most people are honest. At least they tell us that they're honest. So a lot of self-report data suggests that most people tell very few or zero lies per day. Now, on average, people tell about one to two times per day. But a lot of people who we call prolific liars, they actually skew that average. Like Frank Abagnale. Let's go back to Xavier University. Let's time him to see how many lies he can tell in just 60 seconds. The clock starts now. Judge me. Uh, the guy who wrote Catch Me If You Can, Stan Redding, was a police reporter. He interviewed me twice and he wrote the book. He exaggerated a lot in the book. Abagnale denies that he had anything to do with his autobiography. It's the same thing he told me in Vegas. So if Stan Redding, his co author, wrote the book, then why did Abagnale repeat the same lies in his other book, The Art of the Steel? Did Stan Redding write that book too? He exaggerated a lot in the book, so the publisher put a very strong disclaimer in the front page of the book published in 1980 saying that all events, dates, names, places have been changed in this book. That disclaimer, by the way, is pretty standard. Books change names, dates, and places all the time to protect the people mentioned in the book. The disclaimer, however, says nothing about it being a work of fiction. In fact, it's marketed as a true story. Steven Spielberg bought the rights 20 years earlier when he was making Jaws. He then made it 20 years later, and he converted it into a movie. Jaws, by the way, was released in 1975, around the same time that Abagnale was stealing camera equipment from a kid's summer camp. I really, really doubt Steven Spielberg knew Abagnale from a hole in the wall. Okay, okay, I'll stop interrupting. Maybe I was not involved in the movie. I never saw a script in the movie. No one talked. This whole thing about not being involved in the movie doesn't jive with this claim that he made in the Carson podcast. Here comes Leo walking back in, and he says, would you come and live with me for a week at my home out here in L.A.? If you could come just live with me and be a house guest with me, uh, I could learn so much, and I, you know, I want to play this part. This is a real person, real person living I want to do this part well, but nobody can know about this. By the way, I made a whole bonus episode about this because it's just plain delusional. At one point, Leo's dad walks in on the bosom buddies. Oh, it's great. But I digress. Back to David Markowitz, the expert on deception. He says that unlike most of us, prolific liars are constantly lying. These are people who are telling 10, 20 or more lies per day. Now, they might be small white lies or they could be pretty big, serious lies. And why is that? Why do the prolific liars feel the need to lie so much more than the rest of us? Is that is it some sort of self-defense mechanism? So there are a couple of hypotheses or a couple of uh, reasons why there might be. So some are at the individual difference level, meaning there might be just something particular about these individuals that predict whether or not they're going to be heavy liars or not. Um, I recently did a study where I looked at some of these people who have prolific lying tendencies, and they were higher on measures of what we call the dark triad, psychopathy, Ooh, nice. narcissism, and Machiavellianism. They were much higher on those dark triad measures than these everyday liars. The dark triad sounds really spooky, right? Psychopathy, narcissism, Machiavellianism. You know, I interviewed a serial killer on my other podcast, Criminal Conduct, and many con artists and serial killers share very similar traits. And how important is it in your line of research for deception to be believable? Does there have to be a component of it that's actually real? Yeah. So it's a really fascinating point that you're highlighting. So in the deception literature, we often think about lies versus truths, and we often think of them as being these sort of you either have it or you don't, but that's not actually how deception works, right? So you have to draw on truthful information. And I have this metaphor for deception as a faucet. So you can't always have just hot water or just cold water. Sometimes it's like lukewarm and you have degrees of truthfulness or degrees of dishonesty. And the reason why a lot of this happens is something called the plausibility principle. So in order for a lie to be believed and for you to sort of dupe another person, 
you have to draw on truthful events that are plausible, that are realistic, that might have happened in order for that other person on the receiving end to buy into your deception. Otherwise, if I were to tell you that I had breakfast with Barack Obama this morning, you might say, is that plausible? Is it plausible that someone who's located in Eugene, Oregon right now could have breakfast with Barack Obama? Very implausible. So you have to figure out what's plausible or not to actually understand how lies draw on truths as well. David Markowitz and I had a fascinating conversation about lying. If you want to listen to the whole thing, I'll post the interview on Patreon and on my new Apple Podcast subscription channel. When we return, we're going to talk to a guy whose name you heard a bunch of times on this podcast, but you haven't heard from yet. His name is Alan Logan, and he's the author of The Greatest Hoax on Earth. We're going to try to tie up loose ends, like Frank Abagnale's father. Did he simply fall down the subway stairs and die? Or does someone push him? We have the death certificate. That's after the break. I am Alan Logan, the author of The Greatest Hoax on Earth, Catching Truth While We Can. Alan Logan is the guy who wrote the book on Frank Abagnale. The real, actual Frank Abagnale, not the mythical creature we've all seen in the movies. Logan's book on Abagnale is astonishing. He collected police records, court documents, newspaper clippings, rare speech recordings, you name it. And he's pieced it all together and revealed a much creepier side of Abagnale, a picture that the general public just wasn't aware of. When I reached out to Alan Logan about the story, he declined my interview request. Honestly, he was over it. You know, the truth is, at that point, I will kind of had had my fill of Frank William Abagnale Jr. and uh, had been disappointed largely with, with the response. Despite the bombshell revelations in Logan's book, the media's response to it was meh. It didn't seem like the world cared. I'm starting to move on. I'm finally getting out of this this rabbit hole that I've been down in. And it, it's like, it's not easy to do that. I'm feeling the light. I'm seeing the light at the end of the, of the of this tunnel that I'm trying to get myself back out of. And I don't really want to go back into the maze again. But... And here comes the, the little Cuban pulling you back yeah, in. Yeah, well, like... this is the thing. The little Cuban <laughs> is a special character because... I knew when you contacted me that you were really sincere in, in what you were trying to do. Alan Logan challenged me to recreate his research. He felt he needed another journalist to validate his work. So he pointed me in the right direction, and I was able to independently get my hands on the same records. Everything that Logan wrote in his book checked out. You just <laughs> you took the entire thing and ran with it. Since I started this podcast series, Alan and I have joined forces and we've expanded beyond what's in the book. Together, we've talked to new witnesses such as Abagnale's ex-girlfriend, J.R., retired FBI agent Al Brown, and even Frank Abagnale's own niece, Heather Abagnale. And I suspect that even after this series is over, we're going to still be on the case. You know, it's really hard to tell the story because many people don't know the true story of Frank Abagnale, but those that do know that he may have fudged the fact here or there think that he's a reformed man. Since the age of 21, he's lived a really productive life. And you know what? That has to be worth something. Sure, that's very admirable, except that's not the case. Even after the age of 21, the reformed con man was still scamming people. And Alan and I have the documents to prove it. You know, one thing we haven't talked about in the, in the podcast so far is all these promissory notes that he he and his wife Kelly signed, which leads me to believe that after he was done writing bad checks, he moved on into to selling people really bad ideas. Well, we know from what Mark Zinder has told us uh, that Abagnale was asking Mark Zinder's parents to invest in him, you know, and they turned him down. Let's just assume that Abagnale was going around asking for loans for legitimate investments. He and his wife, Kelly, defaulted on these loans. Either they were really bad investors or this was just their latest scheme. The promissory notes were not for small sums. These are for large sums of money, $20,000 in the early 80s. It's a significant amount of money today. And he 
was able to convince a local doctor $20,000, and then it was to be paid back in a, as most promissory notes are at a relatively short period of time. And the idea was that Abingdale, the, the picture that he presented was that, hey, things are great. So many things happening, you'll get, you'll get a massive return on, on investment here. Obviously they didn't get a return on the investment and they eventually wanted their money back because they're entitled to it. If he didn't, you know, he had to give them their money back. Otherwise there would be significant penalties. And we only know of these two, whether or not there were more, we don't know, but this stuff dragged on for years. They were trying to get their money back. One of the promissory notes dates back to 1983 and the doctor who gave out the loan was still trying to get his money back almost 10 years later. I mean, you've recently uncovered that he filed for bankruptcy in 1991 in Tulsa. So it makes sense. You know, you have all these outstanding promissory notes. You, you have this bankruptcy, put two and two together. But this is what's important for people to understand is that this is taking place during the reformed years. This is not the catch me if you can years. I think it's really important. And so it was easy for him then to continue to do speeches, chambers of commerce and all that, and, and essentially just brush that off. It was so easy to do. But over time, his, the excitement surrounding his book and everything did wear off. And this guy was on the ropes and I haven't seen anyone report on that before. So he was not living a very successful life. Alan Logan has been in contact with both parties named in the promissory notes. The doctor didn't want to talk about it and was even careful not to mention Abagnale by name. He said, and I quote, I can confirm the unpaid debt owed me by the subject. The subject? Who talks like that? The other woman was also nervous to go on the record. Why won't these people talk? Well, maybe it's because they settled the debt and are under some sort of non-disclosure agreement. The court documents trailed off in the early 90s, around the same time of the film's release. You know, how complicit do you think Steven Spielberg and Leonardo DiCaprio and Johnny Carson, you know, these guys propped him up. You know, how... how how responsible are they for creating Frank Abagnale? Uh, yeah, I mean, to me, Spielberg is the most responsible at, at this level. And then superficially, you would think, oh, he got hoodwinked by Abagnale. Yeah, maybe you could argue that. But Spielberg repeated Abagnale's claims as if they were true. I mean, again, this is not speculation. You can go and find many clips on YouTube um, when Spielberg was marketing the film hard when it first came out, where he is stating that Abagnale cashed checks in all 50 states and did all these things. I couldn't embellish it because I don't have the imagination of Abagnale. These are all quotes from Spielberg. Just, I mean, prior to Spielberg getting involved, Abagnale was like an old Plymouth sedan running down the highway, leaking oil, smoke coming out of the back. <laughs> I mean, that's what this tale was. His book and all the nonsense within it was on life support, to say the least. You know, it's really disturbing that he's gotten away with it for so long. Can we talk about the privilege that Frank Epigno has as a white man becoming this public figure? And then compare that to Albert James Calhoun, a black man who committed very similar crimes, yet he had a very different outcome. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a really remarkable case to reflect on because it happened in Baton Rouge. It was the same judge. Both of them were three-time recidivists at this point. Both of them had been charged with forgery. Neither one of them were massive forgery cases. Albert James Calhoun, he had a previous conviction where a guy claimed that Calhoun was walking him home after being drunk at a bar and he stole 200 bucks from him and he had one DUI. So this is who we were dealing with when Calhoun faces the judge. Abagnale, as you know, you've told your listeners, was sentenced to 10 or 12 years probation and psychiatric treatment. I mean, that was the key part. He demanded it. He wanted it. He, in his words, he begged for psychiatric treatment. That didn't happen for Calhoun. Calhoun shows up and he gets three years of hard time. The, the real point that you're underscoring here is that those benefits were not afforded to Albert James Calhoun. Now, Aber Albert James Calhoun served his time, went on, a, he died not that long ago in Baton Rouge. Now, I ask you, Javier, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If Albert James Calhoun 
got out and said, hey, went to his local bank and says, hey, you know what? I'm an expert in forgery. I'm going to teach you everything. And by the way, I've been an assistant attorney general in, uh, I don't know, Idaho. I've flown around the world. I've been a professor at Stanford. What do you think would happen with Albert James Calhoun? You think he'd be told, hey, come on in. You should be speaking to the Chamber of Commerce, Albert. Uh, he would definitely wouldn't have a Broadway musical made. Absolutely his- not. And the, that is the larger point. Now, Ab- that, this is not Abagnale's fault. And he, he, in a way, I mean, he's working with the system that's in front of him. But where it gets really problematic is when the system has, you, you, you've worked the system up, down, left, and right, where you really have had minimal consequences for all of the actions that you've taken. And then it would be one thing if this guy was really a warrior for important causes, for criminal justice reform. But instead, you have sound bites where this guy is essentially demanding that more prisons be built and the walls are higher. I mean, you got sound bites of this guy saying. And that it's not harsh enough. It's not harsh enough is what he's saying now. It's ridiculous that people today uh, go to prison and live better than people on the street who would never think about breaking the law. They have air conditioned, they're fed, they're taken care of, they have medical, they have educational. Instead, a prison should be a place where you go to be punished. He's saying it's too easy. I mean, that's what really, really gets under my skin. It's one thing to take advantage of privilege because that's the way the system, as unfair as that is, and we should be fighting against it. But I don't want to fault him for that. It's the issue that I have is that now that you've taken advantage of all of this, that you can't use all of your power and your public voice and your man of ethics to say, hey, we need some desperate overhaul of the criminal justice system. And that absolutely is like acid in my stomach. Yeah, it's because he barely served time. He barely served time. In our last episode, we introduced you to Heather Abagnale. She's the daughter of Frank's older brother, Roy Abagnale. During our conversation with Heather, she told us about a rumor that was going around the family that Frank Abagnale Sr., the father, didn't simply just fall down the subway stairs and die. The word was that Frank Sr. owed the mob some money. Mom, isn't there like maybe, didn't, isn't there something, didn't dad say that his dad maybe had some connection to organized crime? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's what he believed. He, he believed that he was knocked off. Someone pushed him in the subway. We can't speculate on something like this. So we were able to get our hands on the official death certificate to find out exactly what happened. The death certificate states that the immediate cause of death was due to a fractured skull and brain hemorrhaging. But there are a few more details in this death certificate that leads us to believe that there's more to the story. But what really struck me about the the death certificate was that the date of death was several days later. Frank Sr. fell down the stairs on March 9th, then died two days later on March 11th, 1972. What's interesting about the death certificate is it notes on there that the police investigation is still ongoing. That's right. The cause of death reads, quote, circumstances undetermined pending police investigation. So the incident happens, you know, maybe he owed some loan sharks some money. I actually feel like the evidence would lean in that direction. The odds of someone chirping and falling in backwards and getting him, yeah, it can happen. But the odds of owing some people some money, and we know the dire straits that Frank Sr. was in at that point, based on some letters that he sent down to Baton Rouge, he said he didn't have the money to go down to Baton Rouge. I filed a freedom of information request with the New York City Police Department to get any police records associated with this fatality. They've assigned an officer to my request and promised to get back to me in a few months. Once I get the records, you can expect a bonus episode So stay subscribed if you want to know the outcome. When we come back, we're going to bring this whole thing to a close. And I'm going to show you how you, the listener, yes, you, helped make a difference in this story. It's pretty remarkable. You know what? I often forget that people actually listen to this podcast. I'm usually alone, sitting in my closet, talking into a microphone. I tell a story, 
and don't usually get much in the form of feedback. But this series is different. Very, very different. Some of you guys are really fired up, like my listener Lisa Beans. She wrote to me on Facebook and said, quote, It's less about the fact that his story is a lie. Lisa adds, What's more fascinating to me is that no one seems to care despite it being exposed multiple times. She says it's mind-boggling, and you know what? She's right. It really is hard to believe that despite all the truth we put out there, Frank Abagnale will continue his grift. But things are starting to change, and we have real proof of it. Because of listeners like you and Stephen Vogel, we know that AARP now acknowledges that Frank Abagnale is no longer an ambassador to the organization. And probably the biggest sign that we've done our job is that Google added a big fat disclaimer at the beginning of their Frank Abagnale video. The toxic Google video has almost 15 million views. It's the first video result you get when you type in Frank Abagnale in the search bar. Because of you, the video now starts off with a disclaimer warning viewers that Google does not endorse or condone the content within the video, nor does it lay claim to the validity of the actions described. YouTube also shut down the comments and decided to keep the video for historical purposes only. That's huge. It's kind of like what we said about some people thinking that you're just trying to debunk a movie and some thinking people thinking, oh, this is 50 years ago, who cares? No, he's, he actually, until early 2021, he was making 30 grand many nights out of a year to talk about this life that he was an attorney general, you know, dating Grimian's daughter and all the things that you covered in the podcast. He was saying those things until yeah. a matter of months ago for big dollar money. And it's funny because now he doesn't mention that at all. He doesn't take any podcast interviews or any media interviews. But maybe we missed the point. Maybe Frank Abagnale was trying to tell us the truth this whole time. The criminal mind stays the same, thinks the same. It's the same scams that they did 50 years ago are the same scams today. They're just using another method to do it. You know, people ask me today, what was the most incredible thing you did? Well, really, it's not the five years of all the things I did, scamming people and posing as people, but the ability to have now taken all of that and made it into a business where I've made 10 times the money I made scamming people is what makes it really amazing. It is amazing. It's why we're talking about it 40 years later. Here's retired FBI agent Jerry Williams again from the FBI Retired Case File Review podcast. So when we talk about Frank Abagnale and we have to give him his props, he is one of the biggest fraudsters in the world. He really is. And he does it with a smile. <laughs> He does it with a smile. So uh, <laughs> he really is. I mean, you got to give him credit. This this is the longest con. Besides institutional cons or like religious and government cons, this is the longest con that I know of that was that's been executed by an individual for forty years. He's been doing this as long as the Rolling Stones have been a band. Okay, <laughs> that's how long this con is. I've been producing this podcast for five years, and I spent more than 100 episodes studying con artists. And all this time, I have yet to encounter the elusive long con. I mean, I've seen it in movies and TV shows, but rarely have I come across a con artist clever and methodical enough to actually pull it off. So what is a long con? A long con is an elaborate confidence game that goes on for months and months, maybe even years. The whole time, the mark thinks that they are in control, but that's just part of the plan. The con artist is patiently waiting, willing to resist the temptation to immediately profit in order to reap the final reward. Like I said before, I've never really seen a good example of a long con. That is, until I met Frank Abagnale. Don't get me wrong, I don't think Frank Abagnale is some kind of genius. In fact, I see him more like a lucky idiot. Here's David Markowitz again, who's dedicated his studies to deception. Another thing is that they often take up the opportunity for deception much more 
than everyday liars. So for example, and I gave people an opportunity to cheat for really small amounts of money, like 25 cents if they solved either a math problem or a word problem. And some of these problems were unsolvable. So you had the opportunity to cheat. So these prolific liars were more likely to cheat on these really one-off menial tasks than these everyday liars. So they take up the opportunity when the opportunity presents itself. It's you and I who allowed this lie to continue as long as it did. We were the ones that wanted to believe, but the truth was out there all along in plain sight. So if you're wondering why a con artist like Abagnale is able to pull off a very obvious lie, it's because we let it happen. Misinformation only works as long as we accept it to be real. Major corporations, even the FBI themselves, have fallen for Abagnale's lies. Today, the guy charges $20,000 to $30,000 per lecture. $30,000! At one point, he posted his rate on his own website. Just imagine the hundreds of thousands of dollars he's made on just this one lie. And when I surprised Abagnale in Las Vegas after his keynote speech, I wasn't starstruck, but maybe it's because I was the only person in the room who knew he was a fraud. When I approached him, I shook his hand and felt the kind of emptiness you get when you meet a stranger. The man is just that, a man. He hasn't really accomplished anything in his life other than leaving people's lives in shambles. But I'll give Frank Abagnale this. He actually pulled off the longest con I've ever known in my lifetime. We're on the home stretch here, and before we get the wrap up, I did want to say that in a way, I'm like, I do have, I really kind of feel sorry for this dude in a way. Like there's a part of me that doesn't really relish this. And I actually kind of feel sorry for the dude. I was hoping that with your work and mine, that he would see it as a as an escape hatch and he would be able to get out from underneath it all. Yeah, just lean in, lean in on it. <laughs> yes, and he had that opportunity with Jim, but it's obvious that he can't and he won't. And so it's like, he's on there and he's saying, deny that I get out. And, and as you said, it's the ship's going down, but he won't, he's still, he, the easiest thing to bail the ship out is to just say, and then but he can't. I think there's part of him that really wants it to stop. <laughs> right? Yes. But then there's this other part of him that wants it to go on. For- but I do think that the pendulum is starting to shift now, that there is increased awareness, that there is this thing out there. That And what you're doing is so clever. And it's something I didn't really get into in the book, but the, what your use, the way that you so deftly use um, facts, victims' voices, but also humor and, and parody. And the Tinder swindler to me is the ultimate way to parody this to show the absurdity of it to show them how it should be mocked i mean this should be mocked the idea that there should be jazz hands and singing and tap dancing no it sh- there shouldn't be because it's grotesque but, uh, are you glad that i pulled you back in <laughs> yes i'm well i'm glad because i'm just really thrilled with what you've done i mean you really uh, you just deserve so many accolades, and I don't know if there's awards and, and uh, Emmys for podcasters and what have you, but you really deserve so much credit for what you've done, the courage that you've shown. But I think that's why we make a great partnership, because uh, you compare me to the squirrel, to the nut, where I <laughs> just go after it until I get what I want. And you're a fantastic researcher. And I think that our two skills combined has been dynamite for sure. But Alan, do you have any plans on updating your book with all the new information that we found? I think it would be worth doing so because there's just, there's so much information that's come out of your podcast uh, that really brings a lot of nuance into it. And um, I would like to do that at some point soon. There's so many new relevant facts right now that you've uncovered. And I will probably hold on off on that for a few months because I suspect that you aren't (laughs) quite done yet. Oh, you see, I'm trying to get out of this and now you're trying to pull (laughs) me back in. (laughs) Well, Alan, thank you so much, man. This has been a long time coming. Finally, I got you on the show. This was the real Catch Me If You Can, by the way. I caught Alan Logan. Well, Javier, thanks a million. I will sign off with the words of Frank W. Abagnale Jr. These are actual words and I'll say it as we close. Skepticism is a virtue.
Right, we've made it to the end of the real Catch Me If You Can series. And I know for a fact that one man has been listening to this podcast, and his name is Frank Abagnale. Frank, it's time, man. It is time to come forward and tell people the truth. I mean, your little excuse of that you didn't write the book, that's not going to fly anymore. You don't have to do it on my show. Do it on somebody else's show. Contact. I have contacts to the New York Times. If you, if you want, just email me. It'll make a hell of a story. It may even make the front page. I realize that this lie has kind of gotten out of control and it's turned into a monster. But you know what? There's still time, man. You're still here with us. And we're all humans. We all make mistakes. We all lie. But we know about your lie. Look, I know that you claim that you hired a law firm to contact every victim that you stole from. But we know that's not true. I would start out by contacting Paula Parks and just apologizing. She may not even want her money back, but a simple I'm sorry would do the trick. Contact JR. You know, you really screwed with her, man. What you did to her was really messed up, and a simple apology will go a long way. It's not too late to tell the truth. next time on Pretend. The weekend or the week of 4th of July, he said, guess where I am? And I said, I don't know. And he said, I'm in the parking lot of the hospital. And he said, I'm going to sit here all night and wait for her to show up. I'm going to kill her. I've been working on this story for over a year now. And he kept me up all night and I'm like hysterical. He said things like, I'm going to stab her in the neck and I'm going to take her out into the, the desert and burn her body. A stalker has been driving this family crazy. Who is this person? Why is he tormenting them? Gosh, I can't tell you anymore because this is probably the biggest mystery I've ever worked on. And you're going to be hooked. That's coming soon on Pretend. This has been an exhausting series. I'm sure both Frank Abagnale and I are glad that this is over. (laughs) But before I go, I, but before we go, I have to make sure to thank a few people. First of all, Heather Arrington for that amazing rendition of the Tinder Swindler and Jim Grinstead with the Scams and Cons podcast. What you did in Cincinnati, man, is amazing. And of course, Alan Logan, who has been behind this whole series the whole time, you have to check out his book, The Greatest Hoax on Earth. You can find it on Amazon, and I guarantee you it's probably going to be the best thing you've read all year. But if you want more, I'm about to release a ton of bonus content on my brand new Apple Podcast subscription service and Patreon. So if you want to support the show, go to pretendradio.org and look for the donate section. You can make a one-time donation or you could subscribe to Apple Podcasts or Patreon where you can get free merch and lots of bonus ad-free episodes. It's a great way to support an indie podcast like this. And another great way of supporting the show is to tell a friend. You have no idea. This show is so small. In order to get the message out, we have to tell more people. Tell a friend, grab their phone, and subscribe for them. They'll enjoy it. Trust me. Okay, I guess that's it. Stay tuned for the new series called The Stalker, only on Pretend. We'll talk real soon. Take care. No one needs another true crime podcast in their life, but we know you want one. Melissa and I are best friends, and we wanted more, too. When Whitney and I couldn't find exactly what we wanted, we created our own. Cults, Crimes, and Cabernet embraces the grim realities of the world with a side of wine. Don't drink wine? That's okay, too. Over the last three seasons, our true crime journey has evolved from being a listener like you to becoming advocates. Each week, we cover an unsolved case in a different state in an effort to create new leads to help advance the case. To take advocacy one step further, we also travel to locations to help families of those who have gone missing or have been murdered. Whether it's a foot search or passing out flyers, we will be there no matter where, no matter who. We invite you to join us. 
So pop a cork and grab a glass because we have work to do. Colts, Crimes, and Cabernet is available wherever you get your podcasts. Jody Loomis, Jessica Baggin, Kelly Ann Prosser, Michelle Martinko, Christy Mirak, Carolyn Rose. Do these names mean anything to you? All these people are murder victims whose cases were cold for decades until recently. They were solved by investigative genetic genealogy. This new crime solving tool is rapidly providing us with the names of elusive killers. But each one of these cases is unique and worth exploring. Each episode of the DNA ID podcast will focus on one newly solved case and look at the story behind the headline. Who was the victim? Who was their killer? And why did this tragic crime occur? It's brought to you by Abjack Entertainment, hosted and produced by me, Jessica Betancourt, and co-produced by Mike Morford. Make sure you subscribe to DNA ID today, wherever you listen to podcasts, so you don't miss a single episode. Creative Babble.